Yesterday, I did my best to lay the Trinitarian and the Christological foundations for what I'm going to say today. I left you with me lying on my bedroom floor with my family around me praying the Lord's Prayer. So we begin into our second session today, which is to look at the church. The beauty of the R that begins the prayer that Jesus invites us into is that while it is intensely personal, it is far from the private, myopic, just me and Jesus thinking, sadly prevalent in much of present-day evangelical Christianity. The R of the Our Father lives out in the spoken word, the reality sent by the resurrected Christ through Mary Magdalene to the disciples, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. That beautiful R that the Lord opens our lips to say can only be and truly only is ever prayed in the spirit-given faith that the incarnate Son has made himself baptismally one with me, and so has made his prayer my own, as he unites my prayer through his flesh to his own. What is on the lips of Jesus, the Spirit has put on my lips. So what is on my lips, in faith, the Spirit places on the lips of Jesus. At the core, then, when any Christian prays, there is always at least three voices united in the R that addresses the Father the Christians, the spirits, and the sons. This truth beyond question should and can embolden the weakest of faiths and strengthen the feeblest of voices in prayer. No, we never pray alone. No prayer is ever private. I never have to go it alone before the Father. Christian prayer is always a team sport, with the star players of the Son and the Spirit on my side. But, and although there needs to be no but, and that that but in so many ways has been neglected and even denied by much of Protestant Christianity, including, sadly, Lutherans at times, no small part due to Roman Catholic errors connected with that but. But there is a but that is acknowledged by the Lutheran confessions, and that but is that there are more players on the team. None of these other players measure up to the star players, none carry the whole team as they do, which to some degree was part of the Roman error, that moved the Protestants to choose to ignore and even dismiss the rest of the roster and bench the rest of the team. Without question, prayer to the saints and angels to request the joining of their prayer to our own gave rise, especially in common practice, to an idolatrous regard for them that dangerously put them on par or even at times ahead of the Son and the Spirit, resulting in a disastrous semi-pansoterism and horrifyingly, and even worse, almost semi-pantheism. Understandably, this horrific perversion made many of us in many ways gun-shy of any talk of the intercession of the saints. But Luther and the confessors did not fall into the error of denying or dismissing it altogether. A fact that I must admit I was not made aware of until I went to seminary and studied Luther and the Lutheran confessions and came to know of our belief stated in the 21st article of the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, that we grant that the angels pray for us. We also grant that the saints in heaven pray for the church in general, as they prayed for the church universal while they were on earth. That we grant that Blessed Mary prays for the church. These were among some of the things that I had to apologize to my wife about, because she was Roman Catholic when I met her, and I tried to set her straight on what was all wrong with the Roman Catholic Church. I got to seminary and had to come back day after day and say, oh, you know, I was really wrong when I told you all that stuff. (laughs) <laughs> While the prayer of the angels is attested to by Zechariah 1.12, where the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Jer- Judah, against which you have been angry these 70 years? And the martyred saints in heaven are seen by John under the altar praying, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? The confessors could find no scriptural support for the Roman practice of the invocation of saints. However, as they clearly state, the angels, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and the saints pray for us. This, I would say, simply flows from the truth that they, like all the baptized, are most surely and even more fully and completely abiding in Christ in heaven, and so intercede in and with him at the right hand of God, where he is interceding for us. Surely in heaven of all places, the saints do as Jesus does. It would be odd indeed if those in whom faith is perfected and love is all in all would cease to do what faith and love move us to do. Look to the Father by the Spirit through Christ to hallow his name, make his kingdom come, cause his will to be done, give daily bread, 
forgive trespasses, lead away from temptation, and deliver us from evil. For the church as a whole and for every individual Christian. Von Balthasar puts it this way, when Ignatius pursues his seminal contemplation before the whole court of heaven, he is not embroidering or exaggerating, nor is he translating into ordinary terms an experience which is only valid in the mystical order. He is contemplating truth in its proper context. He has come, as St. Paul says, to the city of the living God. And C.S. Lewis, drawing on the liturgy, makes this point. The consoling thing is that while Christendom is divided about the rationality and even the lawfulness of praying to the saints, we're all agreed about praying with them, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. Although it may be argued that the saints in heaven do not need to pray the petitions of the Lord's Prayer for themselves, nor do we need to pray them for them, since they are in heaven, so are in, need of no, of, and so are in no need of such things. However, this is an erroneous way of seeing God and his gifts. He mistakenly sees God's gifts as something we receive once, and then we are done. We got them. Story over. But the truth is that we truly can never and never do really possess anything. Nothing is ever truly ours, not in the sense of ever being able to truly say mine. God alone can say mine over all things, and so he is the one who must continually give. The fullness of God's grace is not just that he graciously initially gives, but that he graciously continuously gives. All that I have, bodily, materially, and spiritually, I only have because God, moment by moment, continues to give it all to me. As all that I have and will have in eternity, I only continue to have as God graciously continues to pour it out on me forever. This truth is perhaps why the confessors also clearly stated that they did not forbid the prayers for the dead. Not in the sense that our prayers would cause God to give the saints something that they would not receive from him otherwise, but in recognition that he is still the one who gives them all things. The beauty in heaven is not that our prayer will cease, but that it will be perfected, and that we will know to ask, want to ask, and take joy in the asking, as we will live forever in the certainty of the continual receiving. C.S. Lewis, in one of his letters to Malcolm, summed up the case for praying for the dead in this way. Of course I pray for the dead. The action is so spontaneous, so, so all but inevitable. I hardly know how the rest of my prayers would survive if those for the dead were forbidden. At our age, the majority of those that we love best are dead. What sort of intercourse with God could I have if, I, if what I love best was unmentionable to him? God has already done all for them. What more should we ask? But don't we believe that God is already and is already doing all that he can for the living? What more should we ask? Yet we are told to ask. And so as the saints in heaven pray for us as members of the church, and we are not in error to pray for them as members of the church in heaven, which I would suggest we do when we pray the Lord's Prayer with Christ. So together we, as the true one body, are joined together in the intercession of our head before the Father. Luther, in his simple way to pray, encourages Master Peter the barber to begin his prayers by saying, I pray in the name of my Lord Jesus Christ, together with all the saints and Christians on earth, as he has taught us, our Father. Luther encourages us in the truth that we, in prayer we are not only come before the Father by the Spirit in Christ, but we also do it in communion with the whole church, the saints in heaven and all Christians on earth. As further, he encourages Master Peter a little further on, never think that you are kneeling or standing alone. Rather think that the whole of Christendom, all devout Christians, are standing there beside you, and you are standing among them in a common united petition with which God cannot disdain. Von Balthasar puts the same truth in this beautiful way. Thus the word of God, when it comes to a person praying in solitude, as a part of the church, seems to be attended and borne along by countless others praying with him. This one word which I now encounter, as if for the first time, is the same word before which vast numbers of people have bowed in worship, which they have heard with all their souls, and which had the power to fulfill them, convert them, and refashion their lives. The Lord promises that at his return he will come in the clouds of heaven, surrounded by the angels and the saints of God. This is how he now appears in prayer. And just as there is the church which descends together with the word, there is also the church which ascends with the individual to meet the word. And both together are one catholica. Or as he puts it more concisely, even when 
Contemplation takes place in the secret room of the Sermon on the Mount. It is never the act of a hermit, isolating him from his fellows. On the contrary, it places him at the center of the church. Now that, my friends, is a prayer chain of epic proportions. No having to get Doris to call Martha, to call Gertrude, to call Fran, to call Mabel, to call Shirley, to call Bertha, to pray for Mary's phlebitis, or having to post an all-points prayer bulletin for all your friends on Facebook. Although asking others to pray with or for us for a specific need is a good thing to do as we are encouraged in Scripture to pray for one another. We should be encouraged in the truth, and no matter what the need may be, our prayers about it never come before the Father alone. Of course, the star, star players of the Son and the Spirit are always on the field with us, but so is the whole roster of heaven and earth. When we ask others to pray for us and they join us in prayer, they are in a way a sacramental sign of the hidden spiritual reality of the greater praying church. The congregation gathered on Sunday morning in the liturgy, after it all, is just such a sacred sacramental sign of the church Catholic. To illustrate, let us consider for a moment the case of the sufferings of my poor 85-year-old father, who fractured his skull and suffered a brain bleed when he fell off a stepladder on Monday of Holy Week this year. Needless to say, the last three weeks have been hard, beginning with the 12 hours that I sat with him in the chairs in the ER waiting room before we saw a doctor, and another three hours before he had a CT scan, and finally at 5 in the morning got a diagnosis. After another five days in ICU, he was released directly home on the Holy Saturday, where over the next four days he got dehydrated, went into kidney failure, and had his bladder overfill that pressed on his bowel and caused no end of trouble. After several falls, we had to call 911 to have him readmitted to hospital. At this point, we are not sure where everything stands, as he was the main caregiver for my mother, who was diagnosed with dementia in November, and he has slipped into delirium and can barely stand, let alone walk. As I'm sure you can imagine, I haven't ceased praying for him over the last three weeks, often just adding my own groans to those of the Spirit that are too deep for words. I know and have found immeasurable comfort in the truth that my prayers for his health and healing have not risen to heaven alone, but joined with those of my family, my friends, and his and my congregation, have flowed into the great chorus of the earthly and heavenly church that continually rises up, deliver us from evil by the Spirit through the Son to the Father as I have also been encouraged by the truth that my plans for sustaining of his and my faith in the midst of this great trial have flowed into the Church Catholic's ongoing petition that our Father would hallow his name and make his kingdom come. The same can be said for my pleas that God's good and gracious will would be done for my dad, that he would help us to submit ourselves to whatever the will, God's will might be, and that he would help us both to do his will by helping my dad to be a good patient, by helping me to do his will, by fulfilling my vocation as a son to my father. Those petitions have also not only risen on high by the Spirit through the lips of the Son to the Father either, but have also flowed into the heavenly and earthly church's great chorus, prayed in concert in the petition, Thy will be done. The same can be said of all our other prayers under the burden of this cross, our pleas for the ongoing needs of my parents in either retirement or nursing care, as well as provision for all of our family's expenses as we travel to and from our homes to look after my mother and to see the needs of my father in hospital. All of these flow into the Church Catholic's continual petition, give us this day our daily bread. Likewise, her petition, lead us not into temptation, gathers in and bears up to the Father our prayers that we be kept from doubting him and falling into despair, as trouble and trial is added to already great burdens, and we are brought to the edge, if not beyond what we can bear and are barely able to cast our burdens upon the Lord that he might sustain us. All this is simply the truth behind the ours and the us's of the Lord's Prayer. As we pray to our Father by the Spirit, with and through the Son, we are praying not just for our own needs, but for the needs of the Father's children, on earth and in heaven. Jesus does not tell us to pray, give me this day my daily bread, but give us this day our daily bread. Certainly me and my is included in the us and the our, but us is more than just me, and our is far more than just my. With us and our, we are never praying only by ourselves, for ourselves, but with all and for all of God's children in heaven and on earth. So as my prayers have risen up to heaven for my Father, all of God's children have been praying for him in their us's and ours. As we have been praying for all others, when we have prayed for our us's and our ours, 
to our Heavenly Father in the confusion of the ER, amongst the beeping and blips of the ICU, and on the geriatric floor. To return again to our image of the team on the field is to understand that in prayer we all play our part, as small and as insignificant as it may seem, as weak and faltering as we may be. Yet led by our star players, we all work together, leaning on and depending on one another. As our prayers for my Father are being carried along by the prayers of the Church, we, even in our helplessness and need, have helped carry along the prayers of others as we have prayed with the Church. As Juan Paltasar puts it, for the Church is not a gathering of hermits, each praying and contemplating in solitude, only having contact with one another in peripheral areas of life, it is the communion of saints. And C.S. Lewis comments in one of his letters to Malcolm, Will you believe it? It's only recently I made, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, a part of my private prayers. I festoon it around, hallowed be thy name. One always accepted this with theoretically, but it is quite a different when one brings it into consciousness at an appropriate moment and wills the association of one's little Twitter with the voice of the great saints and we hope of our own dear dead. They may drown out some of its uglier qualities, set off any tiny value it has. Sadly, we often consider prayer outside the truth of the communion of saints, which is no surprise as our sinfulness at its heart is all about dismantling the communion that God created us in with Him, with one another, in order to stand on our own. Sinners want to, like to, and are happiest standing on their own. It allows us to live in the delusion of the lie that we bought into in Eden that we would be our, could be our own gods. But God did not create us for such demonic, infertile independence, but for a sacred, fruitful interdependence. Christian prayer, then, is never a solitary exercise. A Christian never opens his mouth or speaks alone, even when he prays by himself. When he prays rightly, he always prays with others and for others. As von Balthasar puts it, to regard the hearer of the word in the New Testament phase exclusively as the individual would be to have a false idea of people's contemplation. The various forms of Protestantism incline in this direction. For it is the holy people which is the hearer of the word. The individual Christian, the praying person, only exists as a member of this people. Athanasius was right to recognize the lonely battles of Anthony, the father of monasticism, were decisive both for his spiritual sons and for the whole of Christendom. And Origen expressed something similar with regard to the spiritual struggles of the true theologian, who genuinely hears and understands the word of God. Such campaigns were fought in solitude on behalf of the people of God. For centuries, however, the Hellenistic concept of contemplation, monos pros monon, the alone to the alone, outweighed the social aspect. And as he puts in a very Lutheran way, here the Pauline idea of the functioning of the various members in the mystical body prevents us from being content with the rather superficial notion that the contemplative prayer of the individual believers acquires a special merit from which the other members benefit. For the profound unity which exists between the act of contemplation, which lovingly takes the word into its very being, and the act of the Virgin Mother, Mary, and the Virgin Mother, the Church, implies far more than this. It means that the contemplative mysteriously is Church. He participates in the universality and the boundless vitality of the Church, which pulsates throughout all members, informing them with faith, hope, and love. So in prayer and all other aspects of the Christian life, God is at work to bind back together what man in sin has separated. As von Balthasar puts it, God brings the isolated together in the most diverse ways, in prayer itself and in the apostolate, in everyday life, in liturgy, at work, in the family, in friendship, and in casual acquaintance, which, however, can be a source of strength for years to come. He draws together all the isolated who bear within them the image of the Virgin Mother, the Church, who recognize each other by this imprint. They are in the bride, put at the bridegroom's disposal. Their existence bears his seal. The church is not external to them. They are in it. In these gray and latter days, when the church is struggling in so many ways and so many places, as she is afflicted from within and without, as she stumbles along under the burden of the cross on the Via Dolorosa that she has been asked to walk, as her individual members are often dismayed feel so isolated and pushed to the brink of despair for their mother and themselves. There is great comfort in the truth that the race that the church is running 
not one that she runs alone, but a great team relay race. The first leg of that race has been run already by the Son of God, who has opened up such a great lead in the race that our team's victory is certain, even if all those who have received the baton from him barely crawl along after him. The team cannot fail to win. He continues to follow along beside her, encouraging each of her members on as they run in a pack together, praying with and for one another, working as one to finish their course. Furthermore, the great cloud of witnesses that surround her are not simply bystanders or even just fans watching her run, but members of her team in the great relay race, who, having handed the baton on to her as they entered into glory, continue to have a vested interest in her progress and will and cheer her on with their prayers. I cannot say enough how profoundly this truth has comforted me in these last tumultuous days of my church and family life, so I must thank you for asking me to come and speak to you at this time as is often the case when I'm sent to speak to anyone or pastorally comfort one of my sheep, right as the words are coming out of my mouth, I'm often struck by the fact that I really needed to hear and be encouraged precisely by what I'm saying. In those moments, it is clear that what I'm saying are not my words, but the words of the one who sent me. And so, whether or not the Lord has an mercy used me in some small way to awaken or reawaken you to some truth about the communal nature of prayer through my poor prattling mouth, he has without question encouraged me by having me ponder it and prepare to speak to you. This is no doubt the answer to the mystery as well of why God will allow my church and family burdens to weigh so heavily upon me just as I was trying to make time to prepare these presentations for you. At the best of times, C.S. Lewis' self-reflection that the truth is I haven't any language weak enough to depict the weakness of my spiritual life. If I weakened it enough, it would cease to be language at all. Resonates deeply with me. I also sympathize in my flesh with his statements, prayer is irksome, an excuse to omit it is never unwelcome. When it is over, this casts a feeling of relief and holiday over the rest of the day. We are reluctant to begin, we are delighted to finish. While we are at prayer, but not while we are reading a novel or solving a crossword puzzle, any trifle is enough to distract us. Now, the disquieting thing is not simply that we skimp and begrudge the duty of prayer. The really disquieting thing is that it should be numbered among the duties at all. For we believe that we were created to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And if the few, the very few, minutes we now spend on intercourse with God are a burden to us rather than delight, what then? If I were a Calvinist, the symptom should fill me with despair. What can be done for, or what should be done with, a rose tree that dislikes producing roses? Surely it ought to want to. I also found some comfort in his reflections on the fact that when it comes to prayer, we are only a work in progress. As he says, I'm therefore not really deeply worried by the fact that prayer is at present a duty, and even an irksome one. This is humiliating. It is frustrating. It is terribly time-wasting. The worse one is praying, the longer one's prayers take. But we are still only at school, or like doing, I tune my instrument at the door. Influenced by a world that finds an overabundance of value in our feelings, I was also encouraged by his statements of a notion that what seem our worst prayers may really be in God's eyes our best, those I mean which are least supported by devotional feeling and contend with the greatest disinclination. For these, perhaps, being all will, come from a deeper level than feeling. In feeling there is so much that really is not ours, so much that comes from weather and health from the last book read. But by far the most comforting truth when it comes to prayer is found in the truth which is profoundly personal. It is never private because it is something that takes place by the Spirit in Christ amongst the communion of saints. Von Balthasar's words ring perhaps even truer today than when he wrote them. That Paul's, we do not know how to pray as we ought, has probably never been as relevant as it is today. We live at a time of spiritual drought. The images of the world which in former times spoke of God become obscure ciphers and riddles. The words of Scripture have been whittled away by rationalistic skeptics. Human hearts have been so crushed and trampled on in this age of the robot, which I'd add, the age of the iPhone, they are no longer sure that contemplation is possible. Prayer finds them basically full of doubt, insecurity, and despair. They creep along close to the ground and dare not stand upright. They feel drawn to every negative act, ready not only to doubt God, but also to resist Him perhaps even to hate him for letting the world carry on as it does, for being so high and aloof above the need to intervene. 
Nowadays, the temptation to say no, to yield to weariness is very strong. And so his comfort too needs to be heard even more now than when he set pen to paper in 1955. It is here that the idea of the praying church comes to our aid. Prayer, contemplation is not only possible in the church, it is a reality today just as it ever was. Furthermore, there is an unshakable bond between the church's great secure prayer and the tentative, stumbling prayer of the individual. In the world, there are millions who pray, but all their prayers are gathered up into the one, all embracing prayer of the church, the bride. Thus, the multiplicity of mankind's praying is taken up into the prayer of the head and representative of mankind in the presence of the Father. The church supplies not only the form, but the reality of the individual's prayer. There is one place in God's creation where the world is ceaselessly in conversation with God. Here by the power which radiates from above, the earth opens itself to a heaven which already stands open to earth. And this open heaven is the eternal Son of the Father, who has been given to the earth and desires to bring creation home to the Father like a bridegroom, his bride. Amongst the many moving and thought-provoking experiences that I had in the summers that I spent working on an archaeological dig in Israel, one that continues to stand out in my mind is the evening when a fellow seminarian who had come over to spend a couple of weeks on the dig with me and I prayed evening prayer together with a small sputtering candle as a sunset over the Mediterranean. What was so moving and continues to give me thought was that beyond the fact that there were two, two of us gathered in the Lord's name in the land of our Lord's incarnation at, as the sea air blew over us and its waves rolled onto the shore, was that we prayed in the archaeological remains what had been St. Paul's prison cell as he was held in the governor's palace in Caesarea Maritima, to be praying in the same place where the great apostle prayed and where other Christians had prayed, when they, had, they enlarged that cell into Byzantine, in the Byzantine period into a little chapel, tied you in such a profound and moving way to God's faithfulness and the continuity of the Christian faith. I have had opportunity to encourage congregations in the decline that are facing possible closure with the truth shown by that experience that even though centuries later, after all the citizens of Caesar and Maritima were long gone, the Lord gathered his people in that place to hear his word and call on his name. So too we never know with all the places in this land that one day may be empty, yet it could be filled again. What has further enriched that moving experience of 25 years ago is the realization now that in that moment, they were not simply repeating something in an ancient and holy place, that had been done there long ago and was long past, but that we were actually participating in something that was ever ongoing in God's eternal presence. Now, only were we, not only were we praying in the place where St. Paul and those who had followed had prayed, we were praying with them in that moment, as we were praying with all those who will pray after us long after our own dust returns to the ground to lie dormant until the resurrection of the flesh. For truly, as we pray in the Spirit through the Son, all our voices blend together into one great chorus that reaches the ear of the Almighty in the one moment of his eternal presence. For the praying Christian, there is never just his own feeble, faltering petition that rises up like a wisp of incense before the Father's throne. It is always support and surrounded by the chorus of all God's people that echoes out supporting the glorious area of the eternal Son. As small and feeble as any Christian's prayer may be, it is ordained by God to sing its part and nevertheless contributes to the volume and beauty of the hymn that rises up to heaven and reverberates around the throne of God. This was true of the repeated O gods that were on the lips of my suffering father in the hospital, as it was true of the subconscious and conscious Lord have mercy in my mind and on my lips as I helped care for him. Both our cries, as small and feeble as, and as of little faith at times as they were, flowed into the great Kyrie eleison chorus of all God's people of all times and places that supports and flows into the Son's breathtaking, deliver us from evil that ever moves the Father's heart. Thank you. Just one quick question. You were talking about the thing of the Romish practices of prayer and faith, and you said a couple of words, and I heard the first, the second one, but not the first one, was semi-pantheism, but what was the big word before that? Oh, and pansoterianism. The, mm. Mm. More than one savior. That <laughs> I don't know if it's actually a real word. I just made it. <laughs> thought it sounded intelligent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's much like as I grow 
older and longer in the pastoral office, I don't need to have as many books on my shelves to impress people when they come in. I can start weeding some of them out and <laughs> only keep the good ones. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about, I'm, I'm assuming you're distinguishing between praying for the saints in heaven and uh, praying for the dead that they would make it to heaven. I yeah. I think spoke yeah. A, little, a little bit about that. Yeah. So the, the idea that, and I really came to understand this truth, that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, that we're praying for the whole church on earth, and we're praying for the church in heaven, in the sense that, that Lewis kind of draws on, and I had long talked about that, that everything that we receive from God is continually be, being given to us. And this is part of the perfection of heaven, is that we realize that God is God and we're not that all things flow to us from him. So it's appropriate to keep asking him to give us these things, not because he won't give them to us without giving, you know, without us asking, but that simply that we're called to be his children and ask to receive these things from him. So that, that distinction of that when we pray for the dead, that we do not pray that God would, you know, move them up closer to him or whatever. It's the idea of, you know, getting out of purgatory and all that nonsense. But more of the sense of that we would ask God that would bless them and pour all his good gifts upon them. And I found this for husbands and wives and their you know, widowed or that they, as like Lewis said, the people I love best are all dead. And you know, if I can't pray to God about them, if I can't talk to God about them, then you know, what am I going to talk about? And so that, that you would ask, well, God give them rest and peace, that it's not inappropriate to give them rest and peace. We pray that God would take care of other people who are living with us, full well knowing that God will provide for them anyway. But we're told to ask, as he said. So in that, in that understanding of, to kind of recognize what I often really emphasize with people, grieving people, you know, the person who has died is not dead. They're alive in Christ. They're not gone because they're with Christ and Christ is with us. They're not lost because we know exactly where they are. So that I continue going forward, then although Christians die, they're never dead because they're alive in Christ. So live out that reality and the truth of the church and, and with angels and archangels, the whole understanding of what that means for the divine service that we all gather together, that we're all one before Christ. And the closest that you can be to someone who has gone ahead of you to heaven is at the altar of the Lord. And again, for the, for the grieving, it's such a place of comfort to come to the Lord's table and be close with those people would you comment on the, the expression um, prayer warriors and as they storm heaven with their prayers? Yes. We, we use that much, church. Yeah. <laughs> but we, we hear about this. Yeah. The whole many prayer warriors storm yeah. the gates of heaven. Yeah. You know. Yeah, which is what I was going to actually have you sing. I, the one thing that was late in recovering in my brain was uh, from my stroke was the music center. So um, I was hitting the music center. Was, it took a long time to, to struggling away, praying matins in the hospital bed, you know, to get back to some of the tunes. But if somebody could help us to sing this. It's the tune, that, Dear Children of the Heavenly Father, if, you, if we can hang that out and if you can. Yeah. But in connection with that, it's, it's, whenever I talk about prayer with, with lay people at home, it's all, we go back to, Luther, as dear children ask their dear father. So does a dear father need warriors coming at them, and do they need to storm them to get what they need? This, this came out of my presentation to our Synod Convention some number of years ago on prayer, where it really was founded on the idea of the family and built off of Luther's as dear children ask their father. And it tries to address some of the you know, erroneous ideas of, you know, that we got to get as many people praying to God as possible, and then he'll answer us. Or if we hit 95 on the faithful meter, then he'll give us what we want. If we're at 90, well, too bad you didn't make it quite, you know, come back later. Yeah. Lord of 
I didn't hear any dead in there. Yeah, no. That, that's a new one I'm working on that I haven't quite got it done yet. I, I don't know if you're familiar with the quote. The only quote I had ever heard regarding Luther and prayer was it was to be encouraged, but it was something along the lines of, but once and then we set it aside. I, have you ever heard that quote? And that's the only one I yeah, use. So yeah, yeah. I'm surprised by the ones that you mentioned because I had never heard heard that before. So I, I felt comfortable, you know, my father died in December. Yeah. And I say, you know, a quick prayer, you know, that, yeah. that's okay. Yeah, yeah. But to set it aside after that, that anything more than just, you know, I pray, you know, we do pray, I was thinking in your lecture, when the committal service and, you know, there's prayer for the body, that we would, you know, raise these remains of the day of the resurrection of all flesh. So there is that prayer, but yeah. you're arguing that Luther said even more than that. Well, I think it's to understand that, in, and my neighboring pastor actually uh, prepared the funeral rite for the, for the agenda. And originally, they had the commendation where they commended the person to, to God. And that was the, some of that was kind of frowned upon. It was like, well, again, close to, you know, we got it. So they had to re, kind of reword things a little bit. But the, the idea that any time that you think of this person, you know, and particularly with a parent, there's grief. In the, but, you know, with someone that you, a uh, spouse or whatever, there's even more that they're bearing with and they're working through their grief and everything to, to, you know, be able to pray to God, you know, God have mercy on them, grant them peace and rest and, you know, so what you're saying is it's not wrong for me to pray the Lord's Prayer on behalf of my, my dead father. I, I would say that you are, whether you are intending to or not. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I, I Just on the committal, one more thing, I guess. So, like, so we got to uh, more recently a man in my congregation who died. You know, and, uh, you know, it happened that morning. He wakes up. He has he's had a heart attack of some sort. They, him to the hospital and he's you know he's, he dies on the way the family gets there you know the body's been dead for yeah i still did the commendation of the dying yeah. i mean to me i if i'm wrong i, I accept correction yeah. but you know we commend the person yeah. to the lord yeah. um it we just happen to be a few minutes late yeah yeah and it's uh, it's to understand again that idea that that god continues and continuously gives and some of this really got back to a presentation I was asked to do first time I went to the Corpus Christi Con Youth Conference in Northern Europe. They asked me to speak on the Holy Spirit. And my fellow pastor friend of mine said at the time, boy, they sure give you small topics, don't they? <laughs> but it was just to recognize, you know, going through Scripture and understanding the Spirit and how the Spirit, you know, people struggle with, well, is the Spirit given in confirmation or not, or what's going on? So understand that the Spirit is continuously being given that the Spirit flows from God continuously, that it's not, a, well, we got him and now that's it. We got, you know, we're holding on to his feathers and we're, we got him. He's constantly coming to us and constantly being given to us. And so for, even for those who are at peace with God, that they're continually being blessed with his peace. And so to ask God to continue to give that to them is not wrong. He's going to give it to them anyway, but we've been told to ask. 
All right. Uh, it would seem that Luther's quote about uh, where he says, when you have done this once or twice, then cease and commend the soul to God. It seems that that's in the context of when you're not sure if someone is saved or not. Mm. And so he says, um, since it's uncertain and we do not know whether the soul has been sentenced, it is not a sin to pray for them. However, you should pray in such a way that you let it remain uncertain and say, Dear God, if the soul is still in the state that it can be helped, then I pray that you would be gracious to it. Once you have done this, once or twice, let it suffice. So I don't think he's talking at all about those who have departed in the faith, which is yeah. maybe what you're talking about. Yeah, I appreciate that. And where was that? Uh, where is that quote? Um, Luther's 1522 sermon for the first Sunday after Trinity. It says the one positive thing that I'd say for the electronic version of books and everything on the internet is at least you don't have to spend umpteen days going through some, you know, 50 volumes. But at least when you go through the 50 volumes, you might stumble across some other good stuff that's in. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so to a certain extent, the prayers to the dead, it almost even, a quote I had that I came across from Luther right before my stroke was, pray and let God worry, which I found so comforting. It's like, well, we're worried about so much. It's just, well, commend it to God and let God take care of it. And so for the dead, too, as, as we're feeling anguish over them or even as, you know, their, whenever their memory comes to my mind, even I'll, well, God grant them peace and rest. Or, and to recognize even now in the Lord's Prayer, when we're gathered in divine service, that we're praying for the whole church. And they're certainly part of the church. And I think it was, you mentioned yesterday how, you know, we, we, we love to systematize things and have them um, in neat boxes yeah. to teach. Yeah. But when we teach, we find that they spill over in them. Oh, yeah. It sounds similar to Luther's argument for uh, icons and images. Yes. That, you know, when you hear the story of the crucifixion, what's in your head? Yeah. I mean, you already have the icon in your head. You yeah. already have the image. Yeah. Is that the same? Yeah. And maybe that's the answer to the prayer warriors, too, that we, most of the time, we think God's so petty and so small yeah. that... Like you said, if we don't get 95%, yeah. then God, well, sorry, God, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe that one time you didn't, yeah. you, you're yeah. out. Yeah. And instead it's, well, for lack of a better phrase, it's grace upon grace. Yeah. Right? It's continuously happening. Yeah. Yes, we get grace at baptism. Yeah. Yes, we get grace at communion. Yes, we get grace at comfort. Yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just piled yeah. higher and deeper, if you want to say. I think, too, the, the comfort in all this is, is you know, not only the, the idea of the prayers of the dead, which I was shocked about when I heard at the seminary, the one professor took delight in shocking us as much as he could and you know, throw these things out. I said, what, what, what do you mean, you know? And he said, well, there it is, black and white. <laughs> he also beat us to death with the Semper Virgo, too, then. And actually, if anything, he turned me off. He was, he was a disciple of scare. And his teaching was very in a very scary in style, <laughs> which for Ontario boys was very scary. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Stevenson, I sat down with him the one time, and he just put it out so very plainly for me. And this is a whole other thing, but he, he just said to me, well, what is, who is Joseph? I said, well, he's, he's a Jew. He said, well, and who's in Mary? Who's been in Mary? The Lord of hosts. Is Joseph going to go where the Lord of hosts would be? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, the, the awareness, his understanding of the holiness of God would have you know, moved him to regard Mary as holy. And not in any way that saw sex as a bad thing, but simply that he just would recognize the holiness of, of who she was in the, in the way of the holy, holies of the temple. So, but I think getting to the, the idea that not so much that we pray, pray for the dead, but that they're praying for us. And I've comforted the grieving often with this too, that, you know, it's not like, it's not like the dead can see every minute detail of our lives, but it's not like they get to heaven and like some pastor would say they get there and they're just so thrilled with Jesus that they just forget about everybody else. And it's like, well, they're so filled with Jesus, where is Jesus' heart turned but to us? So that, you know, in Christ, they are thinking of us too, and in Christ, they're praying for us too. They're not cut off from us. We're still all bound together through Christ. I think we, we tend to compartmentalize on this, and of course, uh, I mean, as the girl said, you know, we did it. Very systematic, you know, especially as Lutherans, 
we, we get the, the ancient expression, we go at labor, pray, and work. It sounds like those are two, two functions that are separate. And yet, my favorite musical is Fiddler on the Roof. Tevia is constantly talking to God. Always working. Yeah. Always walked while he's doing everything. Yeah. He's constantly in yeah. communication. And I think that's probably what we need to focus on yeah. instead of or an animal. Yeah. 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 And for and to understand too that as I suffered terrible uh, post-stroke anxiety after my stroke and Del, you know, was plunged into the depths of mental illness for several months. It was just horrific. After that experience, I told people, I've been to hell and you really don't want to go there. It's it just horrific. It's just a byproduct of the stroke. And they said, like, a form of a mental PT or a medical PTSD. And, and so the fullness of what had happened in that moment as I was rushed to the hospital, I didn't deal with it at the time, but it all came roaring out afterwards. And... But the, to understand that, that, you know, the people in that place, you know, that are so depressed or so anxious or can barely pray, can't pray a lot of time. And to understand on that moment, the spirit is praying within us. But not only that, but the whole church is praying for us and with us. And we're not alone in the midst of all this. We're being borne along. Mm. Yeah, it's just thinking then with our goal of Lazarus and rich man, it seems less important to be praying for Lazarus or even Abraham, than for rich man's brothers, you know. Yeah. Like, maybe we should be thanking God for where they are, that we, we don't need to worry. Yes, yeah, yeah. And so there's a prayer of for them, a prayer and thanksgiving, too, that, you know, that, that we give thanks to God for them, and all that he poured into our lives through them, all the good that he did for us through them. That, so essentially, you know, to understand Prayer is, is, is that element of conversation with God, that we unburden our hearts before him, we lay out things before him, we talk to him. And that gets to the, the whole question was of prayer as a means of grace, this discussion. If prayer is always bound, you know, founded in the word of God, you know, and as Balthazar gets all into it, all, you know, he's talking about contemplation, he's talking about prayers that we meditate on the word of God and we speak to God in our meditation. Well, if the Word of God is present in prayer, well, then, of course, it's a means of grace. The Word of God is a means of grace, so. Pastor, I don't really have a, a question, but a rather a commendation for you. I, I, I went to a, a very elite graduate school, and we had world-renowned scholars, and the greatest compliment you could give them was that they had been elegant. And, and you have been elegant in so much that you said, but at least two things that have been wonderful clarifications for me. Uh, one is in praying to God, the fount of all goodness, and that is goodness to go on heaven and in earth, that obviously is goodness flows to the church triumphant, as well as the church. And so in that way, you're not, you're not so much praying, you're praying for the, the dead, but God's goodness includes all of it. Yeah. And so that's a wonderful idea yeah. that sets straight for me some yeah. of the um, uh, uh, things. And then the other is you gave the very best defense of Simper Virgo that I have ever heard of. It makes more sense than anything that anyone's ever said to me. Being a good Protestant, I resist certain things that they're described in Latin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Well, you, you have to understand from St. Joseph was yeah. that he was an, an older man and, and, and righteous, which is why God, he yeah. was as much consecrated and selected by God as yeah. the Blessed Virgin. Yeah. And the simple thing you said is he would have recognized that the, 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 met, the God incarnate had been in the womb of the Virgin Mary and would he have dared or would he have, would he have gone where in, into something yeah. holy. Yeah. I, I never ever thought of that yeah. construction that way. But it, it's it's the best defense I've ever heard of since the Yeah, for me it really came down to essentially at the end was just sim simply submitting myself to the church. You know, so this explanation really helped me to understand and grasp it and but but to recognize that up to Peeper 
Uh, you know, the church, the Lutheran church was consistent. Pieper even says, well, as long as your Christology is okay in every other aspect, we won't hold it against you if you don't believe, if you believe that Mary had other children. But uh, he's got a long excursus in the German about the, about the perpetual virginity of Mary. It's like, and all these guys, Luther included, the funniest thing that we ever had happen in seminary was uh, John Stevenson and Jonathan Groth, he was the president of the seminary at the time, were always battling out over the Semper Virgo and you know, launching bombs at each other. But, and a friend of mine came up to me and I had some Luther in German. He said, oh, could you help me translate this? And I was working through it and we came to this one word, it was coarse, I couldn't figure it out. The coarse fool. And I said, well, Dr. Grothy knows German. Let's go up and ask Dr. Grothy. And what the passage said was, if, it was Luther saying, if you want to follow that coarse fool Helvidius and believe that Mary had other children. <laughs> and so we go into Dr. Grothy's office and we say, well, can you, can you, can you try and help us translate this? And he just roared out as only Dr. Grothy can roar out. Did John Stevenson put you up to this? <laughs> And we're standing there all in innocence, you know, we didn't know, it's like, no. But, if, you know, for me, ultimately it came down to all these people, and going back into the early church, that they were, you know, the closest to the, to the handing on of these things, all believed that, that Mary didn't have other children, and then I'll submit myself to that, and I come along and say, well, I know better now reading the Bible than all those other people did. It's consistent with the, the, the scriptural testimony. You know, the only issue that you run into is that when the exegetes get all bent out of shape about brothers. And again, you have to understand, understand that term in the context of the time, what that actually meant for them. That for the Jews, there was no distinction amongst them between what kind of brothers. They didn't have stepbrothers. You didn't have, they were brothers. And then, you know, as Kurt Marquardt held to, well, why do you have Jesus giving in Mary into the care of John on the cross, you know, if there's other brothers to look after her? would have been unheard of in the, in the Jewish world to do that, to hand your mother on to some stranger when you got other siblings to look after her. You, you mentioned Kurt Marquardt. I just, I just mentioned a quote of his that he spoke to me um, at the seminary. They had, you know, chapel services, what, four or five times a day. And he saw that I went regularly to these small prayer offices, which he always was there as well. Maybe one of the only professors who was there regularly. And after uh, the time prayer one time, uh, he said, yeah, we're the lazy ones who come to these prayer offices. And uh, I'm not quoting him exactly, but his basic point was, this is for the lazy people, um, which I thought was, you know, an opposite way of looking at it. Those who struggle with prayer, yeah. you know, here we're gathered together in the community when we have a hard time praying yeah. ourselves yeah. alone yeah. with the discipline, with the... Yeah. the challenge of prayer or maybe the inability to yeah. pray at times in our lives. Yeah. This, these prayer offices are for the lazy people. Yeah. So I was fascinated with yeah. the thinking about it. Well, ultimately before God, we're all lazy people because everything comes given to us by grace, right? So to see that, you know, in truth that, you know, even when I'm at, alone in my office and home in my prayer gym in front of my icons, that the whole church is gathered. As Luther says, they, you know, don't ever think you're, he says, don't ever think you're standing alone. I would even go further to say you never are standing alone. You're never kneeling alone. That all of Christendom is there with you. And to understand that truth, one of the things that really struck me in Israel was when I went to the church in the Nativity. And one of the most moving things wasn't actually getting right into the cave, but on the way down to the cave, all the graffiti that was on the walls from the Middle Ages of these people who had all been there before. To recognize, well, I'm, in, I'm part of a huge continuum of people that have, you know, followed in this way, and that we're not alone. To me, prayer lets us enter into the mystical, and Satan tries to make things logical, figure things out. To me, the overall mm -hmm. problem with Calvinism is. They figured it out, so they're wrong. Where God is mysterious beyond us, and he's outside of time. We're time now. So when we're praying, we're intersecting with that which is beyond us, and beyond time, and <clears throat> an absolute greater truth. And 
I, I think one of the problems of intellectual, we think things out, and quite often we think things out wrong because we trust our mind instead of trusting what is beyond our mind. And prayer <clears throat> pulls us into that. And I think the, the common people get this closer to than we do. And so it's an invitation. Yeah, and I think, you know, the whole idea of them, the saints praying for us and, and us praying for them, there's a desire for the connection, right? Where I've had widows telling me strange things about dimes. Whenever you see dimes or whatever, that's an indication that the person is there or thinking about you. It's like, oh, brother, you know, like there's a desire. We need to put it in a proper context and in a proper place for them to be able to, to uh, you know, lay their, lay their request before God and recognize the communion that they still share with this person. A very clear way I say it to them as well. Who's got your hand in the midst of all this? Christ. Well, who's holding their hand? Christ. So who, are you connected to them? Yes, Christ is still connecting you to whoever's gone ahead of you. But there's the truth of the mystical, you know, the truth of what's really there. And then also going to what, what uh, C.S. Lewis talked about, about how irksome the flesh finds prayer and everything else in the battles against. Well, the old man, the last thing he wants to do is be dragged into the heavenly things. This is why it's such a struggle, right? He doesn't want to go there. So it's by the Spirit that we're drawn to Christ to be drawn into that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I think I can sit down now, maybe. <laughs> God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>